welcome to Cambridge City Christian Church. My name is Renee Lakes and I'm happy to welcome you to our online service today. I really wish we could be together in person because I miss my church family terribly, but it's great that we can be together online like we have been the last several weeks. I wanted to take a few minutes this morning to talk a little bit about some blessings. Um, during this time, there's a lot that um, is, is, makes us all struggle a little bit, but there's also a lot of blessings that have happened. So one of the big blessings that has happened um, at the Lakes Aaron's house is that as a mom, I've gotten the gift of time back with my kids. So as you all know, Ben is leaving for the Marines soon, and so I've gotten to spend more time with him before he leaves. And Abby has been in Germany since August, and she unfortunately had to cut her exchange program short, but she came home early. So I had the, the gift of having her home when I wasn't supposed to see her until July. So having time with the kids and Andy having time with her siblings has been a, has been a blessing at our, at our house. Um, also, another blessing is that uh, our community has really pitched in and helped our school tremendously during this time, and I can't thank everyone enough for what they've done for our kids. So uh, while this time there are lots of trials, it is also a great time to think about all of the blessings. So enjoy our service this morning, and hopefully we will see each other soon. Good morning, everyone. Hi, I'm Travis Miner. I'm the associate pastor here at Cambridge City Christian Church. And with me this morning are Ben and Hannah. They're here to help us uh, worship God today. You may know, that, know us just as our individual names, but we're also trying to get it to catch on that we've got a band name now. We are Travis Miner and the Quarantines. And by we, I mean I'm trying to get it to catch on because I don't think they're really hip on it. Regardless of the bad dad jokes, God deserves to be worshipped this morning, and we're going to do that right now, so please join us in doing that. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, my great Redeemer's praise. The glories of my God and King, the triumphs of His grace. My gracious Master and my God, assist me to proclaim, to spread through all the earth abroad the honors of Thy name. So come on and sing out, let our anthem grow loud. There is one great love, Jesus. He breaks the power of canceled sin. He sets a prisoner free. His blood can make the flowers clean. His blood availed for me. So come on and sing out, let our anthems grow loud, there is one great love, there is one great love, Jesus. You to God and and love be ever ever given be a saints below and saints above the church in earth and heaven so come on and sing out let our anthem grow loud there is one great love so come on and sing out let our anthem go loud. There is one great love. There is one great love. Jesus. Great is your faith. Oh God, 
you wrestle with the sinner's heart. You lead us by still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people, remember your children, remember your promise, oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough. It is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. Your
to see that you're shaping my life. All I am, I surrender. Give me faith to trust what you say. That you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside. I give you my life. I need you to soften my heart and break me apart. I need you to be. what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life I give you my strong in me, my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. So, give me faith to trust what you'd say, that you're good, that your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my life, oh I give you my life. We now gather together around the Lord's table virtually. <laughs> for communion, and over the last few weeks, we've invited you to participate in communion by one of two ways. One of them is, as we have up here on the screen, is to visualize taking the bread in the cup. You can just visualize taking it right there where you're at, or you can use crackers and grape juice that you've bought at the store and brought home to you. So either way will work. Hopefully soon we'll be together and we can take it together. But until then, um, these are the two ways that we are suggesting for everybody to participate. For a communion meditation today, I wanted to just share with you a little bit about the faithfulness of God. We're going to be talking about that today in our, in our sermon. But there was a song that really jumped out at me when I was preparing for, for this discussion that I'm going to have later in our message about um, faithfulness. And that is the great, one of the great hymns of the church uh, called Great is Thy Faithfulness. And I brought with me here a, um, a hymnal, and I want to just read the words. I won't sing them, I promise. I'm not, I'm not the greatest singer, but I will read the words because they are very um, profound and very touching in, in being reminded of God's faithfulness. It says, Great is my faithfulness, or great is your faithfulness, O God my Father. There is no shadow of turning with thee. Thou changest not, thy compassions they fail not, as thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. And then the chorus goes, Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed, your hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. And, and I can remember singing that song for so many years when I was younger. And, and it, it was just a reminder to me. It brought great comfort 
to know that God was always there and that I could always trust him because he is faithful. The prophet Jeremiah wrote not only the book of Jeremiah, but he also wrote another book right after it in in the order of the Old Testament called Lamentations. And in Lamentations chapter 3, here's what he says. He says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. Does that sound familiar to uh, Great is Thy Faithfulness? That's what Great is Thy Faithfulness, it's based off of this, these, these verses. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. With everything that's been going on with this pandemic over the last, well, two months now, um, it has been hard at times to wait on God's timing, to wait for him to do what he's going to do uh, when he's going to do it. But we can know that God has not given up, that God is still the same compassionate, and graceful, and merciful God that he's always been. And so as we partake of the bread and the cup, as we remember Jesus' body and blood that was given for us, it's a reminder to us of God's mercy and compassion, that no matter what happens, no matter what trial or travail that we are going through, that God is always there and that his promises are always kept. So again, great is, our, great is God's faithfulness. Oh God, our Father, his faithfulness is so good. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this time that we can come together and, and just stop and reflect on what your son has done for us. Father, we thank you for Jesus and his faithfulness and keeping the promise of dying on the cross so that our sins could be taken away. And so, Father, in these next few moments, as we reflect and pause, help us to remember, indeed, um, of your great faithfulness and love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're going to take just a few moments here to be silent before the Lord and reflect as we either visually, you know, visualize the communion or as we actually take it there in our homes. Let's stop here for just a few moments to do that. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke and he said, Take ye, for this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then later Jesus took the cup and he said, This cup, it represents my blood, which is shed for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. Again, we hope here in the next few weeks that we'll be able to partake of communion together, but we are hoping here pretty soon that we'll have some uh, of our elders. They will start again. Be sh- they will be sharing our communion meditations with us online, hopefully by next week. So um, I've enjoyed doing these meditations, but it'll be nice for some others to share with us as well. Um, we're now just going to go into a brief reminder about our offering and our giving. Again, there's three ways you can give. You can send your gift to the church through the mail. You can give online by going to www.4c.church, or you can download the Church Center app from the uh, Google Play or Apple App Store, or you can give by text. You can text any dollar amount to 84321, and when you do that the first time, it'll take you to a web page where you can get that set up. Again, giving is an important aspect of our Christian walk. It's a way for us to show to God that everything that we have actually belongs to him. And so I want to encourage you to give, and it's even more important maybe than ever to give um, in the midst of everything that's happening to allow our ministry to continue online and in our community. So uh, may the Lord bless you. You can give through those means, and let's continue on in our service here today.
Good morning, everybody. This is Danny. I'm the lead pastor here at Cambridge City Christian Church, and we're so glad that you've decided to join us online this morning. If you're a guest, we're glad that you're with us. It's been really neat over the last few weeks to see uh, some new names, uh, watch our um, services every week, and we're so glad that you've joined us. Something that I thought would be neat to share with everyone um, before I get into my message today is kind of what is our uh, outreach, our attendance, I guess you could say, been with all of this online going on and from what we can gather, and I guess, again, some of this is a little bit of a guess because with every view, it's kind of hard to tell how many people are watching. Um, so like if you're watching right now, you might see in the corner that it says something about maybe 90 people or whatever uh, watching. Um, that doesn't give us the whole picture because with each view, there can be multiple people viewing it. Like if a family, like my own family's watching it, there would be six of us watching it. So it gets uh, kind of tricky, but from what we can gather through our online engagement, we've actually doubled our attendance um, throughout these uh, last six weeks. And we probably had a record attendance in our church's history on Easter Sunday. We think we had over 550 people that watched that day. So again, it has been exciting to see what God's doing been exciting to share the Word of God with even more people because there's a lot to be excited about when it comes to God's Word, and we're really excited about this series that we've been going through, and now we are in week 28 uh, of this 30-week series, so we're, we're right at the end, but this has been an amazing series, and I hope you've enjoyed it, and today we're going to be talking about faithfulness, but before I get into faithfulness, I wanted to just remind us of what our vision and our mission is as a church. Our vision and mission at Cambridge City Christian Church is to love God and to love others more and more. And I hope that you have been finding um, more and more reason to be able to do that in the midst of this pandemic. That you found ways to show the love of God to, to other people and even to allow God to love you as you express your love to Him. And I hope our online services, our online prayer service, uh, which will be tonight, as well as our Life Group Live that takes place on Wednesday, that I, I really hope that all of that has drawn you closer to God, even in the middle of everything that's around us that can lead to a lot of anxiety. So again, we're so glad to have you with us today. It's been a blessing to be able to worship with you. I want to give you just a quick COVID-19 update. I, I want to make sure that everybody's in the know about what's happening. This weekend, we're, we've taken the first steps in reopening. Um, you might have seen something on Facebook. You might have heard it through our phone call. We've taken a very small step this weekend in reopening, uh, and the way we did that was with our drive-in service by opening up to anybody who wanted to come. Over the last couple of weeks, we've limited it only to those who uh, did not have online access, and uh, the first week we only had one car show up, but that was okay because it kind of gave us an opportunity to kind of pull things together. Last week, we tripled our attendance. Yes, we had three cars, and it went, went perfectly even though it was a little bit drizzly, it was, it was a great time of worship. And uh, hopefully today we'll see even more. But, but again, that, this is our first step in reopening. Other than that, there really isn't a lot changed. Our office is still closed. Um, our services are still going to be primarily online or, or in the drive-in service. Our youth groups, our life groups, everybody's going to still be meeting uh, from a distance. So uh, not a whole lot has changed, but just continue to be in prayer because when we get to step two... Uh, or phase two of all of this, that's when it's going to get really tricky. And so uh, be in prayer for our leaders, be in prayer for our uh, civil and state leaders as well as they make these decisions as uh, they come down the road here. So just be aware, be watching Facebook, we'll get messages out to let you know as, as these things change. My guess would be that we will not go into phase two at least for another month um, or longer. So just, just kind of keep your ears open and we'll keep you updated. All right, well, I just wanted to review just quickly what it is that we talked about last week, because last week we talked about kindness and gentleness, and I hope this week that you found a person to do kind things and speak kind things to. That was our challenge last week, was to find somebody that we could reach out to and speak a kind word or to, or to do a kind act. I know I've already shared it on Facebook, and I shared it in my prayer service last Sunday, but I was the recipient of it. Uh, I'm not, I'm not going to mince words. At the end of the week last week, I was struggling. Um, I, I think maybe it had just kind of overwhelmed me a little bit. Throughout this entire uh, pandemic, I've been pretty 
calm and confident knowing that God's in control. But for some reason at the end of the week last week, I was really struggling. And I came in Sunday uh, afternoon to get ready for our prayer service. And uh, you know what? I think it's okay for me to say this because I'm a human. I just, I'm, I was not feeling the Sunday night prayer service. I, I just, I was tired. I'd have a rough week just in terms of just my, my mental uh, health and and so um, I'm sitting in my office getting ready, and I, and I hear somebody tapping on my window, and it's Tracy Richardson, and she had brought me one of my favorite foods, Skyline Chili. And it just perked me up, and I went into that online prayer service and uh, was excited to do that. That's what an act of kindness can do, and I hope that you took a chance this week on someone to show kindness. And, and this is all connected, this, this kindness and gentleness, today we're talking about faithfulness, it's all connected to what we've been talking about over the last few weeks of the fruits of the Spirit as they're written in Galatians chapter 5. Uh, let's read that here again real quick. In Galatians 5.22 it says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, today faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, notice that the first fruit in all of this is love. And then when it's connected to all the others, today we're talking about faithfulness, then we realize indeed that love is connected to faithfulness. There is a relationship there and a connection. I want to share a story with you. You know, when I think of faithfulness, I think of this story of this man taking care of his wife with Alzheimer's. And you better get the tissue box out because you're going to need it. I don't count it a burden, whatever, to have to care for her. I I need to do everything. From the moment she gets up to the moment she goes to bed, I do absolutely everything. Um, Clean her teeth, uh, shower, dress, everything. um, But it's it's a privilege. I count it a great privilege to, to care for this one that I've loved all of these years and continue to love. This is the year where we'll celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. Our stories have been a a lovely story. I first saw her when she was eight years old and her brother became my best friend. We grew up together and as we grew up, yeah, she was there. And I knew that she used to stare at me when I was playing footy with with her brother and uh, another friend and when we used to ride bikes and she kept staring at me, but I wasn't interested. I was 17, she was 16. I saw her uh, dolled up, dressed up, and she had an A-line dress on and boom, it was gone. I was, uh, she was the one for me then, absolutely. (laughs) When we first started uh, dating, I used to ride my bike from where I lived to where she was and that was about five kilometers on a Saturday afternoon because it was the only chance we had to get together. And uh, it was hair wash day for her and she used a special cream in her hair for a shampoo. And I can still smell it, because that smell was so particular, so nice. It was just absolutely special. We had a bike. I used to ride everywhere on my bike, and then Glad had a bike as well, and we put a, a baby chair on the front of her bike, and so we carried our babies around on the bike with her as well. So, yeah, bike's been part of our lives, and I guess that has something to do with us now. Around about 2004-05, I began to notice um, that there were things going wrong. She was finally diagnosed with uh, the horrible disease of Alzheimer's. Having lived overseas, I knew that with a bike you can do lots of things. So I had a bike made, a bike chair made. We take it to the beach and ride along beside the beach. And as we do that, we see lots of people. A lot of people come talk to us because it's a unique thing. Nobody else has got a bike chair quite like that one. I am determined to care for her every need, every need. You see, God has loved us so unconditionally. And I understand that God has put his love in my heart. And because I realize how much God has loved me, that's how I too can love my lovely wife. She has done so much for me over all of these years. Now she can't, but I can, and I can return her love. Uh, And it's a love that, uh, well, to me, means I can do everything for her. She's my princess, I'm her William, and I wouldn't (laughs) have it any other way. Would you have it any other way? 
no, 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 not at all. We love each other. Wow, what a great story. Um, <laughs> so powerful. When I watched that, I was just, uh, just overwhelmed by uh, the love that he had for his wife. And, and you could just see the faithfulness that's there. You know, when, when we look at this and we see the faithfulness of this couple and, and what they had toward one another, we are just uh, in awe of that because the fact is, is that we've seen over and over again acts of unfaithfulness in our world and in our lives. We've seen friends who have left us over ridiculous things. Maybe we've left people over ridiculous things. We've seen couples who have drifted apart from one another and have been unfaithful to each other. We've even seen workers who are not loyal to the workplaces that they're, that they're in when they only look out for themselves. Again, faithfulness is something that we all long for. It's something which we all want. And that's why I think one of the reasons is that, that we latch on to God, because we know that God is faithful. We know that we can rely on Him because, indeed, faithfulness is a characteristic of God. Faithfulness is a characteristic of God. In Psalm chapter 36, it says this, Your love, Lord, your love, Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. Wow, what a great verse. See, the people of Israel, they, they knew God to be faithful as he dealt with them. They knew that they could rely on him and that they could trust him and that he would always be there for him. If you go all the way back, I want to take just a, a little walk together through some of the Old Testament and into the New Testament with some different stories that illustrate God's faithfulness to his people. The first one here I wanted to share with you is this one. This is Abraham. Now again, this isn't actually Abraham. We didn't know what Abraham looked like. But when Abraham decided to help God on his promise of blessing through the world by being the one through whom he would build a nation through, by giving him heirs, God gave uh, Abraham his child Isaac, when he was 100 years old. But God proved his faithfulness. He kept his promise to Abraham. Then you also have the story of Joseph. When some of Joseph's brothers were unfaithful to him as, his, as their youngest sibling, what did they do? They sold Joseph into slavery. But God used that event to place Joseph in high rank in Egypt to save the Hebrew people. He was faithful to his people and faithful even to Joseph in the midst of everything that he was going through. And then, of course, we know that for many years, Israel wandered in the wilderness. And when God's people complained and whined, God continued to be faithful as he led them to the promised land. Then we also know of the two spies who, when they were standing on the precipice of entering the promised land, and they were going in to check the place out, only two out of how many? Twelve men spies, twelve spies went to spy on Canaan, right? Or, all right? God was faithful in all of that, and he continued to show his faithfulness even in Samson's story. When Samson revealed his secrets to Delilah, God renewed his strength and helped him to defeat the, Israel, the, the, the Philistines. Again, God was faithful. See, when God's people forgot his word, he waited for them to come back to him. He remained faithful even though they weren't faithful to him. When the children of Israel were taken into captivity, he kept loving them and brought them back home to their promised land. See, God was always faithful to Israel. And from the time, from time to time, they remembered his faithfulness. It wasn't as if Israel was faithless all the time. Because from time to time they did remember it. And they would return to God. And, and they would remember the promises that God had, had given to them and had promised them. And they would mention that in some of their stories and in their psalms. God was always faithful to Israel. But again, they were not always faithful to him. The history of Israel, if you think about it, was a cycle. It was a never-ending cycle of them being unfaithful to God. And then after some discipline, often it was in being taken away from where they, where they were from there in the, in the promised land, then they would finally become faithful for a time, and then they would forget, and they would go back into that cycle again of faithlessness. You know, their relationship with God, if you look in the Old Testament, was often portrayed as a marriage. Jeremiah 
one time when he was preaching to Israel, when they were on the precipice of being invaded by Babylon, Jeremiah warned them. He gave them this sharp rebuke. In Jeremiah chapter 3, he says, But like a woman unfaithful to her husband, so you, Israel, have been unfaithful to me, declares the Lord. Again, they were often unfaithful. We also know the prophet Hosea. and The prophet Hosea's story depicts how God called him to take a wife who was an adulteress, a woman who was cheating on him. Hosea was called to keep her. <laughs> how, how do you think that would go over today if, if a preacher in a church somewhere married someone like that, knowing that they were an adulteress, when they had been instructed by God to do so? I'm sure a lot of people would be thinking, yeah, okay. But God did instruct him to do that. But see, the reason God instructed Hosea to do that was because he wanted to give Israel a living example of how God had continued to show his love to Israel even though they had been unfaithful to him. See, Hosea had been tasked with loving her just as God loved his people. See, God, God is faithful. See, God cannot be unfaithful. What he promises, he's going to do. (laughs) Aren't you grateful for that? I know I am. I'm so thankful that what he promises, he carries out. When he gives his word to us, we can trust his word to know that he's going to keep it. And when he says that he loves us, we can count on his love to come through. You know, the greatest example of his love coming through is is his sending of Jesus Christ to be our Savior. It's no surprise that when he faithfully fulfilled his greatest promise, it was through his son. When When Jesus was born to Mary and Joseph, God was showing his faithfulness. And then, of course, Uh, A little bit later on, we know that Herod wanted to end the salvation story. He wanted to end this promise that God had made by killing all of the the children, the young babies there in Bethlehem. And so what what did God do? He protected Jesus by sending him and keeping him safe in Egypt. God kept his promise. A little bit later in Jesus' ministry, when he was preaching one day in Nazareth, his hometown people, the people that knew him, tried to push him over a cliff because they didn't like what he had to say. They didn't want to accept who he was, but Jesus didn't quit. Jesus was still about making sure that God's promises came true. You know, and then there was some time later that his family would off that his family came and told him, "You know what, Jesus, you are out of your mind." But you know what, Jesus, he kept loving them. When accusations were made against him, that he was blaspheming God, he continued to be faithful to God the Father, and he was faithful to the plan and the promise that God had made toward us. Even when Jesus' friends misunderstood his teachings, he still loved them until they understood. He didn't give up on them. When Peter called him the Christ, and then what happened sometime later, he denied him, Jesus remained faithful to the course of what God had called him to do, and he remained faithful in his love toward Peter. When Jesus was spat upon and slapped and scourged as he was about to be placed on the cross, Jesus was faithful in his calling, and God was faithful in his promise. When the soldier's hands drove spikes into his hands, Jesus remained faithful to his father's promise of sending a Messiah, a deliverer, a savior. See, faithfulness, as we've seen in all of these stories, it's not a one-time event. Faithfulness is a lifetime of steady reliability. It's being there when times are good, when times are tough. See, Jesus taught, Jesus taught that we are to be faithful to God and people throughout our lives. That we are supposed to be faithful to him and faithful to one another. And we saw that through him in his example when he was here on earth. If you look in Matthew chapter 25, and we're not going to read through every verse. But if you want to, you can go ahead and open your Bible there or go to your Bible app and look it up. But in Matthew chapter 25, Jesus tells about a man 
who is going to leave the country, and he brings in three of his servants. And he gives each of these servants a certain amount of his possessions, of his goods, of his wealth, to, to each one of them. And to one of them, he gives five talents of wealth. To the second, he gives two talents of wealth. And to the third one, he gives one talent of wealth. So the man leaves the country, and then they are supposed to use these talents in order to grow his investment, to grow his wealth. It's very interesting in the story, this, this word talent. Now, sometimes people have tried to use the word talent as a a way of illustrating our own talents and our own abilities and God's invested in us and that we need to use it. And, and I think that fits well. That, I think that principle fits well in this story. But when we look at the actual monetary value of a talent, if, if it represented the largest unit of accounting in Greek currency. So when somebody said a talent, it usually would equal about 10,000 denarii. Now, I know for you, you don't probably know the exchange rate for a denarii. But when you add it up, a talent actually would equal an entire lifetime of savings. So think of that. This wealthy man had invested eight lifetimes worth of his wealth into these men to invest in, to go out and to invest. And see, and that's the point of the parable, if you, as you read there in that chapter. God has given each and every one of us a large investment. Now, some of us, maybe it is wealth, but for other of us, it's talents and abilities. But what does God expect from us in return? He expects from us in return faithfulness. He expects us to be faithful. See, Jesus taught that we are to be faithful to God and people throughout our lives. So what happens in this story? The first two servants, they doubled what was given to them. But the last one does nothing. He buried it and protected it. And what was the response of the rich man and what is God's response? Well, to the five talented, to the to the five talent and the two talent servants, here's what he said in verse 21. He says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. Wow. See, Jesus is teaching us that God is looking for us to be faithful to him and to what he has given us. He wants you and me to be faithful to him. But not just him. He also wants us to be faithful to others. In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5, verse 37, look what Jesus says here. He says, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. You know, people of Jesus' day, and even people today, right, they had a way of, of making these elaborate oaths as a, as a way to manipulate people into believing them. So that they would believe that you would do what you said you would do, and they could trick you in the process. That even happens today. I know there's been a few times in my own life um, where I promised to do something, and I think I was a little manipulated into it. See, Jesus here is warning. He's saying, if you're going to be faithful to others, and you're going to care for others, and you're going to be loyal to others, let it be simply a yes or a no. Don't try to fool people. Don't try to trick people. See, he, he wanted them to know that that. They should be people who just give a yes or a no and that they could be relied upon to fulfill their word. That there won't be some kind of asterisk in the promise. But that they will keep their word simply by saying a yes or a no. See, the point this week in our Believe series is this. The point is this, is that I have established a good name with God and others based on my loyalty to those relationships. See, again, let me say that again. I have established a good name with God and others based on my loyalty to those relationships. See, sometimes it is hard for us to do that, though, isn't it? As much as God wants us to be faithful, so often we are faithless and unfaithful. Have you had moments where you, were, when you have done that? I know I have. Maybe you made a promise to God that you just simply didn't keep. And what did you do then? When you broke that promise with God, what did you do? How did you respond to that? Well, the biblical answer to that question is that we need to confess and repent to God. When we are unfaithful to God, we should confess it and we should repent before God and admit that we have been unfaithful. John, who was the closest disciple to Jesus, wrote in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, he said this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just, 
and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. See, when we are faithless toward God, unfaithful toward God, when we come to God and we, and we admit that to Him, we say to God, you know what, God, you're right, and what I did, it wasn't right. I did not keep my word when I said I would follow your word and when I said that I would obey you. See, when you mess up, here's the, the most amazing thing of all. When you mess up, and you will, and we all have, and we will until the day we die, when you mess up, you don't have to worry about what comes next. I'm sure you've been in a situation where maybe you were uh, unfaithful to someone else, and there are heavy consequences that come with that. Maybe you lose a job. Maybe your marriage ends. But when it comes to God, if we come to Him and we confess and we repent, He is faithful. What does it say here? He is faithful to forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. You get you see that? God is faithful. He is faithful to forgive the one who confesses. If you confess your lack of faith, he will forgive you. And you can trust that he is reliable to do that. He's going to do that. See, confession and repentance and getting back on God's path is the way that we learn to be faithful people. You know what God is used to people letting him down. <laughs> it all started back with the Israelites in the Old Testament, and it continues today. Even amongst us, we let him down. But God is faithful, and God is just, and he's always willing to forgive. Amen to that, huh? That is such an amazing promise for us. But, but what about when we are not faithful to other people? What about when we break our word to people it seems, it seems a bit riskier, doesn't it? I mean, we know that if we break our word with God, that God is faithful and he's going to forgive us. But whenever we break our word and we're unfaithful to people, it can come with, in some ways, a lot more risk. Especially when our track record with people is that they may be unfaithful to us. How many times have we maybe legitimized our lack of faithfulness towards someone or something because they haven't been that way toward us? And what about when we break our word to people too? It, it's just totally risky, isn't it? And that brings us to our challenge today. And this is something that I want to challenge you to look at in your life this week. I want to challenge you to confess your unfaithfulness to one you have hurt and ask for forgiveness. To take a moment this week, and I know it's going to be tricky. We're all at home on the most part. Maybe it's someone you work with. Maybe it's even your spouse. Maybe it's a friend. Maybe it's one of your children. Maybe it's um, somebody that you've had a fallen out with in a friendship or in a relationship, and you weren't uh, faithful, you weren't honest with someone. I want to I challenge you this week to confess your unfaithfulness to them and ask for forgiveness. See, when we don't live up to our word, we have, um, we have these gaps of integrity in our life. Uh, maybe we could even call them faithfulness gaps. And in those moments, we are, are we learning then to go to the person to whom we failed to honor our word? When we fail someone, when we are unfaithful to someone, are we people of integrity enough to admit when we make those mistakes and trying to rectify that mistake and trying to rebuild loyalty and faithfulness? Did you know that you could still honor your word even after you've messed up, let's say you've promised to do something or you've promised to be loyal, but you could still honor your word even after you've broken that loyalty or that trust or that faithfulness. You can still rebuild it and, and, follow, and keep your word by following some steps. And I want to give you, uh, there, there's just a few of them, but here are a few things that you can do in order to rebuild your integrity and to rebuild faithfulness within a relationship that's been strained. And here's the first one. The first one is this one, acknowledge to the person that you hurt that you did not keep your word. The longer that you go on acting like you didn't do anything wrong, your integrity level continues to go down, 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 down. Maybe you've not said something to someone for weeks or months or even years because you've been, let's just be frank, and I've been there too, right? We've been hard-headed, and we don't want to admit our our faithlessness in them or our lack of loyalty. We don't want to do that. 
I want to tell you, the quicker you admit, the better it is. Acknowledge it. Acknowledge to the person that you hurt that you didn't keep your word. And when you do this, it builds humility. It grows humility. You know what, in our homes, I think this is so important right now. This is so important right now. In our homes, um, we're probably getting a little bit on each other's last nerve. We've been stuck together a lot more than we've ever done ever, right? And, and sometimes maybe we have kind of maybe done a, something a little behind someone's back or try to hid something or maybe we took uh, something from somebody, somebody in our, even in our home and maybe we, we just haven't brought ourselves enough to the place enough to, to acknowledge that we hurt somebody and we didn't keep our word, that we weren't people who are going to be loyal and faithful to each other. That can be a tricky thing to do right now, but you have to start there. You have to acknowledge to that person that you didn't keep your word. And then here's the next part. You have to admit the impact of your broken word. See, it's not enough to acknowledge your faithlessness. You also have to acknowledge the ramifications that come with it. How did this decision of unfaithfulness hurt that person? You, you have to admit that. You have to make it known. You have to empathize. You have to sympathize with the person that you have hurt in order for you to really understand what you have done so that you can rebuild faithfulness within that relationship. Maybe within a marriage, if you have uh, committed adultery against your spouse, you have to admit and you have to walk through this process of what you have done to your spouse and how you have hurt and devastated their life. You have to understand the ramifications of that. I'll just tell you, you may think that's easy for people in a situation like that, but there's been a couple of situations through the years of my ministry where I've sat down with couples and talked to them, and one or the other of them just cannot find it within their heart to really understand the pain and the hurt that they have inflicted on their spouse. Um, as a matter of fact, often uh, these couple of times that, that I walked through this with people, what happened was they would often focus more on how they had been hurt and why they had committed adultery, but stopped to consider how that act of adultery hurt their spouse. See, if we are going to rebuild faithfulness and loyalty in our relationships with others, we must understand the ramifications of it and how it hurts them. This is so important, so important. We have to admit the impact of our broken word. Here's the next thing I would say we have to do, and that is to offer a heartfelt apology. You know what? Words are really important because it's the best way to share from our hearts. We, we can't read each other's minds. We don't know what each other is thinking, and so our words are, are important. Now, obviously, words can only be words if we're not backing them up with actions. We must back them up with actions as well. But offering a heartfelt apology is so important. I know in just about every case that I have uh, uh, of a couple who have, are walking through an act of infidelity or adultery or unfaithfulness in their marriage, what I've asked just about every couple to do is to write a, a letter to them apologizing and showing some of these principles I've already mentioned, that understanding the hurt that you've inflicted understanding what you have actually done, what you committed against that person. It is so important for us to give that heartfelt apology because that is the only way we can really express what's going on in our hearts and in our heads. It is so important for us to do that, to offer a heartfelt apology if we're going to rebuild faithfulness in that relationship and loyalty in that relationship. And then finally, we need to do this. We, need, we then need to re-promise and, and what I mean is, is that we need to set the stage for the rebuilding of faithfulness. We need to set the stage. We need to say, okay, I know what I've done is wrong. And here I know how I've hurt you, right? And you know what? I, I'm really sorry. It needs to come from our heart. And then we need to start uh, having a plan in order to rebuild the faithfulness. We need to have steps to rebuild and that's often the next step that I have with married couples who've gone through infidelity, is what are some steps of rebuilding that relationship and that faithfulness? Um, an example that I often use with, with many couples is I encourage them to go back to what it is that built their faithfulness, that built their love in their relationship. Go back to the early days when they were dating or when they first met, 
What was it about each other that drew you together? You have to go back to that and you have to rebuild from there. You have to outline these steps and you have to rebuild that faithfulness. I think sometimes we make the mistake of maybe going through the first few steps. We'll, we'll admit we did something wrong, then, we, um, you know, then we'll see how we hurt the person, then we'll offer this heartfelt apology, but then we don't have a plan moving forward. There isn't a plan. It's, it's just like, okay, well, let's just jump back into the marriage, the friendship, the workplace situation. We just want to jump right back into it without really having an outline that's going to actually rebuild faithfulness and loyalty and love and trust. It is so important to have a plan. So important to have a plan. And don't skip this part of it. Don't just jump back into it thinking everything will be like it was before. Because it isn't. We've broken a promise to someone else. It has to be rebuilt. So see, confession and repentance lead us to becoming more faithful. See, that, that's the neat thing about it, all of this, is that even when we are faithless or unfaithful toward God or toward other people, if we incorporate in our lives an attitude and a spirit of confession and repentance, it can actually grow our faith and cause us to be more and more connected with God and other people. See, as, as God's Spirit continues His work in us, we will see day by day, we'll see year by year, that we will become more faithful people. That we'll become people that are more faithful to God and that we'll be more faithful to each other. You know, the video that we showed when we started off today was a tearjerker, wasn't it? But what made that video so special was the story of a man who was faithful to his wife, who loved his wife no matter what had been thrown at them. I know some of you watching today have been in a situation maybe similar to his where either a spouse or a parent has, has gotten Alzheimer's. And it's hard but let me tell you, I've seen some amazing stories, even when they're on our church, of those who have remained faithful and loving toward a person who sometimes can be hard to do that. It, it can be hard to be faithful in a situation like that. But see, we celebrate those stories because we know that that's who God is. And because God is faithful, we want us, we want us to be faithful to one another. And so today... Maybe the first step you can take is rebuilding that relationship with God. Maybe you have been far off and you've been distant. Maybe at one point you, you, you were connected with God. Maybe you accepted Jesus as your Savior. Maybe you were obedient in baptism, but you kind of drifted away. Life got busy. Maybe you got older, you had kids, growing a family, and you just got wrapped up in a lot of stuff with work. Right now in this opportunity, when you're sitting at home a lot, I think God is using this as a chance to call you back to him. Maybe this is sort of like a, a wilderness period where God is calling us back. He's calling us back and he's calling you back. And my hope today is that you would receive that call in your life and that you would recommit yourself to Jesus Christ. And, and perhaps you're watching today and you've never made that decision. Jesus is calling you today. He's been faithful to you. He's been by your side all along. Even though you didn't even know it, he's been there. And now today you know that he's faithful. And he loves you. And he was so committed to keeping his promise and his loyalty and his faithfulness to you that he was willing to die on a cross to cover your sin. That is what Jesus has done for you. And we want to invite you today to make that decision. To accept the faithfulness of the one who will put everybody else to shame. He will never let us down. You know, maybe one day as we grow in our own faithfulness toward God and others, we'll be in a video like the one we saw earlier today. Wouldn't that be pretty cool? I think that would be pretty neat because we need stories like that. We need reminders like that, that indeed God is faithful and we can be faithful too. Well, let us uh, close in prayer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word today and your reminder of your faithfulness. Father, if we go all the way back in the Old Testament and we see all of the stories and how you interacted and loved your people Israel and you remained faithful to them throughout it all, even when they were chasing after other gods, when 
they neglected your word, when they neglected loving each other, God, you didn't give up on them. You kept working through them, and through them you brought to us a Savior. And you fulfilled your promise through that people by giving us Jesus who went to a cross and died for us. Father, you made a promise and you kept a promise. You are faithful and you are loyal to us, God. And we thank you for that today and we praise you for that today. And, and Father, as you know, <laughs> we have a problem with this, a big problem. Father, we're moody. Our, our connection with you ebbs and flows one day we think we could take the world on with our faith and the next day we think that our world is just going to fall apart father i'm sure over these last few weeks and in the middle of this pandemic we may have been at both of those points maybe at some highs and some lows father we're sorry for our faithlessness we're sorry that we are often unfaithful to you and so god we come today and we admit that we have come short. And Father, we admit we have hurt you deeply. You gave of your son. Had nails pierce him. Blood pour out. A body that was broken. Because you love us. And we have been unfaithful to you. And we haven't appreciated that gift. Father, we come before you today in a, in a spirit of repentance. God, we really are sorry. We really do apologize. It, it comes down deep from within, Father, that we have hurt you and we, we are just so sorry. And Father, moving forward, help us to know the plan. Father, I know that the plan is to connect with you, to draw closer to you, because as we draw closer to your example of faithfulness, we can learn more and more how we can be faithful. God, help us to grow in that way. God, I just pray a blessing on everyone that's in our worship time today who has listened to this message. Father, that they would hear you and, and experience and know your love and your faithfulness. And Father, that we would all be challenged today to be faithful to you and one another. God, we thank you for your indescribable quality of faithfulness. God, help us to be more and more like you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are glad that you have joined us here today. Uh, hopefully, we'll be back together again soon. It's, it's getting a little weird preaching every week in front of a bunch of empty chairs. I'm looking forward to uh, getting some, some of you back in here where we can share and worship together. May the Lord bless you this week, and don't forget, we'll have our online prayer service tonight at 6, followed by our, uh, <clears throat> followed by our life group live on Wednesday at 7. And uh, again, we, we miss you. We love you. I love you. And um, we will hopefully get to see you really, really soon.